So good morning. Can everyone hear me in the back? We're going to do two sound checks because I have a feeling we might have to switch microphones back and forth. Um, we decided that since this was 8.30 on Sunday morning, and since it was Derm, which is a lot of pictures, that we're going to tag team this presentation. So I apologize to Dr. Dattar because her name was inadvertently left off the grid. Um, however, I think that this is going to be fast-paced. Um, we're going to challenge you a little bit, and I wish we had an entire day to talk about this topic because we really could fill hours and hours on skin. Um, so there will be lots of things we don't cover. All right, so we're going to kick it into motion by kind of um, giving you a little bit of an introduction, and then we're going to start talking about pictures, although I may start pretty early with pictures. So first thing about skin when it walks into a shelter attached to an animal is that we've got to be able to recognize there's a problem, and we've got to be able to triage the extent of that problem. And so this is challenging because it's kind of like you learn as you go along. It's all about what you've seen before and then applying what you've seen before to the next case that comes in. And so in New York State, and I'm speaking directly to those of you in New York State, but every state has a practice act, one of the challenges is that diagnose and treat, diagnosis and treatment of conditions belongs to the veterinarian. That is defined as practice of veterinary medicine. And legally, veterinarians are involved in diagnosing disease, treating disease, prescribing medications. In a shelter environment, a lot of times the veterinarian is not standing there when that animal comes through the door. Technicians, medical assistants, um, veterinary assistants, trained staff, all of you are front lines for recognizing skin disease. And recognizing that skin disease can be the difference between stopping an outbreak or having an outbreak of a condition. And so our goal is to try and help you think through that process of triage. Um, one of the things that we emphasize in shelter medicine is that the way shelters can equip themselves to kind of handle some of this diagnosis and treatment is to have standard written protocols from a veterinarian. And in the guidelines from the Association of Shelter Vets, they emphasize it's always nice to have guidelines or protocols from a veterinarian with shelter experience. So that they're not just addressing that individual animal and their disease, but they're thinking about the entire shelter and the entire population in terms of how we're going to manage this case. Um, and so we emphasize that, that written, standard written protocols can go a long way in helping you guys be able to enact treatment early on when that animal first comes in. Intake exams in the shelter, often done by technicians, medical staff, trained staff. How many of you, is this true in your shelter? Yeah. So for many of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, that the veterinarian neither has the time nor not, may not be there every day to be able to do this initial triage, and we count on you guys to be able to recognize conditions. The other thing is that don't forget that a physical exam is a screening test. And you guys who have heard me year after year hear me say this every single year. That physical exam is the most important, crucial screening test. It is when you get your index of suspicion that this could be a contagious disease. It could be a problem for not just this animal, but your whole shelter. Um, and recognizing that contagious versus not contagious is the key to stopping an outbreak. So best defense um, to controlling this in your shelter is an early offense. Knowing what to look for, knowing what additional tests to run, and that's what Dr. Dattar is going to talk about today. Um, and, and knowing that this is part of your job and part of your role. We'll start with this puppy dog up here. If I tell you that's a puppy with an erosive skin lesion on its muzzle, anybody got an idea? So puppies can get an immune-mediated kind of cellulitis. It's not necessarily infected, so it, antibiotics are not necessarily your first, co first course of treatment, but you can see that. This is a nose with a bunch of pigment missing. Contagious condition? No. Vitiligo, so something that, they, that is breed related. Um, hard to see here, but we've got, some, uh, we've got cancer versus a pyoderma. And down here, we've got a Pomeranian with no hair on his sides. Could it be contagious? How many have seen bald Pomeranians? Yeah. How many of those cases were contagious disease? None of them. Oh, surprising. <laughs> what do Pomeranians get? This crazy disease called alopecia X. We call it alopecia X, so hormonally related, not contagious. But certainly, if you haven't seen that before, you could be like, oh, Lord, what just walked into my shelter? What am I going to do next? All right? So some of this is pattern recognition, and that's my next slide. Maybe. There we go. 
Pattern recognition is key. And what I mean by this is the more cases you see, the more you know. And you start to establish this sense of what do these things look like in terms of patterns. I stole this from the ASPCA, and after sitting through some cruelty lectures, you may recognize it. But this is kind of a skin and wound chart that we'll sometimes use for just skin cases in general. In particular, this one is showing some puncture wounds and bite wounds on the face, on the forearms, and that sort of thing. What's that a pattern for? Dog fighting. Dog fighting. Dog fighting. Exactly. So boom. There's an example of one that you recognize, especially if you sat through lectures yesterday. So same sort of thing applies for infectious um, diseases and non-infectious diseases of skin. So you want to think about what's the species of animal that I'm looking at. And we're going to cover cats, dogs, and others today. You want to look at other elements of signalment. Are they puppies? Are they seniors? Um, middle age? Look at that age, because that can play a role in the pattern. Where are the lesions located? And we'll actually give you lots and lots of cases today. This is mostly going to be case-based discussion. Itchy or not? And this I stole from Dr. Miller. And you'll see his name come up on a lot of pictures. He's our dermatologist here at Cornell. Is it a rash that itches or an itch that rashes? <laughs> Basically, which came first, the itch or the rash? The rash. It depends. In some cases, the itch may come first. My first case will go over this, and then they get the rash. In other cases, they get the rash, and it's itchy, and then they itch it. <laughs> are there other animals from the household affected? And I'm going to focus a little bit on what you need to find out about history, but are other animals affected? We've got two more chairs down here if anybody wants to be brave and come on across. Um, and then obvious cases. There are some that are like, oh, yeah, I got this, right? Um, so some of them are really obvious. Some of them are going to be much more subtle. This is my little uh, soapbox issue. History taking is key. And I hear time and time again from people who work in shelters, I don't have any history. Stray animal, no history. How many of your stray animals actually have been stray living in the finder's home for like two months? <laughs> OK, that's a history. Um, if the animal was found yesterday and the person kept it overnight, it's probably got some history involved. And so I've worked pretty hard to try and emphasize into people that we've got to figure out a way to get whatever history someone knows. The animal did not go poof and appear in our cage. Somebody knows something about it. And so let's try to figure out how to collect that. So how are we going to do that? When are we going to do that? Who's going to do it? Helpful hints. How many of you have medical history forms that owners fill out when they surrender animals? How many of you have medical history forms that finders fill out when they surrender animals? Good, some of you do. That finder form shouldn't just be where did I find the animal, but it should be how long have you had it? Did you notice anything? Vomiting, diarrhea, is it eating? Did you put anything on the animal? We have diagnosed toxic events where people have put flea treatment and other things on animals they had for 24 hours. If we hadn't asked the question, we wouldn't know why this animal has neurologic signs. Um, that finder knew something, and we didn't manage to capture it. So having forms for everybody can be helpful. That stray surrender, that stray form with the medical may be really brief, but it can be. How long have they been with you? Did you give them anything? Have you seen them eat? Do they have diarrhea, et cetera? Check boxes help with this. So the simpler you can make these history forms, the better they are. Um, Follow-up phone numbers for whoever knows anything about that animal. Make sure you get the phone number so that you can call them when you find issues and maybe get more history. And then another key thing is making sure that if it is an owner surrendering, that they sign something that gives you permission to call the vet for medical records. And we've talked quite a bit about that in the cruelty track around issues of vets give, handing over records to shelters. It's a lot easier if somebody's already kind of given you that permission. And you can fax over that they sign that you could access that information. So the thing about skin cases is they can come in looking really terrible and within two weeks look really great. And you just, you don't know the moment they walk in. But the more you know about trying to narrow down what's going on with that animal, the more you can predict their prognosis. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Dittar, and she's going to talk through some diagnostic techniques. I'm going to stand here with the microphone just in case you need it. OK. Can you guys hear me in the back if I talk like this? OK, great. So um, as Dr. Berliner said, the first diagnostic technique that is super important and is available to every person here in your shelter is the physical exam. You don't need anything special to do this, although I will recommend that you wear gloves. Um, if you notice that there is something going on with the skin, you need to protect yourself and you need to protect the other animals. But um, as Dr. Berliner said, often this is performed by a technician or a medical staff in the shelter. It's not performed by a veterinarian until the technician or the medical staff person says, oh, this is weird. Hey, Doc, can you take a look? Right? Skin is um, the most obvious organ that an animal has. 
Uh, you can see it from across the room sometimes. I can diagnose an animal all the way back there sometimes just by looking at it, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, or smell it, exactly. So um, what I'm encouraging you to do when you have an animal come in uh, and you're performing a physical exam is to use all of your senses to examine them. So use your eyes, but also use your hands and use your nose to try to figure out what's going on. So you'll want to look, this is sort of my order of operations because I tend to be a front to back type of person, but you can do this in any order, just be systematic about it, do the same order every time. So I look around the eyes, I look at and sniff the ears, I honestly will get my nose right in there. Um, I will run my hands through the fur, even with gloves on, I can feel if there are wounds or there are little bumps or if there's a mass or something there that I'm interested in finding. Um, I will look at the feet and the toes in particular because those are some places where you might see the very first signs of certain conditions. Um, and then I also make sure to look at the perineal and the abdominal areas. A lot of times when we're doing our quick exam, we don't even lift the dog up to take a look at their belly or turn them around to look at their behind. And those are really important places to take a look because they may have one lesion and it may be on their belly. And they will miss it if you don't take a look. What we want you to get from this exam, not necessarily the exact diagnosis of what's going on, but is this normal or is this abnormal? If it looks normal but you're not really sure, then that's fine. You can always ask the veterinarian to take a look later. And then if it is abnormal, even before you talk to the veterinarian, you can consider some more specific diagnostics that are particular to the skin, things that can give you a lot more information about what's going on with this animal. So how many of you guys have done this before? Yeah, skin scrapings? They are very, very useful. What we use them for, this is part of your minimum database of skin, is to look for creepy crawlies and other types of things that might be on the surface of the skin. So what you want to do is use a new blade. I've had some shelters that use the same blade over and over again for skin scrapings for all the different animals. They're not that expensive. You can use a new one, it's okay. Um, you want to scrape the skin, not cut the skin. So think of like when you chop nuts on the cutting board and you're getting them into the bowl, that's the kind of motion that you're wanting to use. Um, pick an area where you see lesions. If you pick an area that's next to a lesion but you don't, not on the lesion, you may miss whatever it is that you're looking for. There are two different types of skin scraping that we use for looking for different types of mites in particular. The first one is a superficial skin scraping and the second one is a deep skin scraping. Now, you can do a superficial skin scraping and find what you find and that's great. If you find what you're looking for, then you can stop. But you can always find the superficial skin scraping mites on a deep skin scraping as well. And so many people just go right for the deep skin scraping just in case. If you want to um, grab the skin before you scrape it and squeeze those hair follicles to try to get all of the little bugs that might be in those hair follicles up onto the surface before you scrape it, that can increase your yield in terms of finding mites that you're looking for. A trichogram is another great thing that you can do in addition to your skin scraping to try to find particular bugs. Um, I just tend to use my fingers. I just grab a piece of hair that's right on the margin of that lesion and just pull it out and put it on the same slide that I did my skin scraping in. I'll put two drops of mineral oil on that slide and I'll have one for the skin scraping and one for that trichogram. And I only ever just use one slide unless I can't find something and I have to go back and look, for, look again. You can use uh, hemostats to pull hair out if you don't want to use your fingers. Uh, mineral oil is really what you want to be using. Other types of oil are not very good for this type of thing. Um, and especially if it's colored, it can falsely sort of give you an idea that maybe there's a color associated with the skin, like red for blood, for example, when there really isn't. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned, you can mix that skin scraping and the hair together on your slides to see what you get. Some pathogens are really easy to find on skin scrapings to the point where you can almost just scrape with anything at all and, and find them. Demodex, for example, is one of those. Um, some uh, insects are really hard to find on skin scraping and you may just end up treating even if you don't see them just because the likelihood of that condition is there. So we'll talk about both of those later on. As many of you guys have wood lamp as part of your intake exam. Fantastic. I highly recommend this. It's a very easy test. The animals really don't care if you turn the lights off and you shine purple light on them. It's very, very non-invasive. 
and you can find all sorts of different things. Most of uh, what we're looking for when we put this woods lamp on there, and what the woods lamp is, it's an alternative light source. I don't know if you guys talked about alternative light sources yesterday in the forensics exams, but here in particular on our intake exams, we're looking for ringworm, right? And the ringworm, the reason we're looking for it is because it glows under this particular wavelength of light. So woods lamps are about 360 nanometers. In a dark room, um, you can see hairs glowing. If the, if the glowing hair doesn't wipe off with a wet cloth, it probably is that hair that's actually glowing. Early ringworm, when it's just starting, grows more of a yellowish green, and then later ringworm glows a very sort of bluish green. And so you can see both of these, or sort of the, anywhere they are on that spectrum, for M. canis in particular, with a woods lamp. And that will prevent, if you catch it, that ringworm from spreading to other animals in your shelter, because you'll know what to do with that animal. There are a lot of other things that glow, though, so you want to be careful. So um, urine glows, nasal discharge glows, doxycycline glows, amoxicillin glows. Um, if you stain eyes looking for ulcers, that fluorescein stain also glows very brightly under the UV light. And um, there's all sorts of different sort of trace materials you can see on a dog. Maybe they're little fuzzes from the towels, maybe they're um, other types of uh, debris that they got from wandering around in the environment. All of those things can glow too. But all of those things wipe off, and the ringworm doesn't. So that's kind of a little trick to use. The last one I have here are the things that you're going to use diff quick to stain. So you can use a glass slide impression where you take your microscope slide and you press it against a moist lesion on the animal. You can use a swab to grab some material and smear it onto the slide. So this is particularly good for things that have holes like ears or um, if you have a, a particularly exudative lesion on the skin, you might be able to grab some of that material and put it on the slide that way. Or you can use an acetate tape prep. And these are great for things that are inside the hair or on the hair um, or in little tiny crevices that are hard to reach. So you can actually um, look at, use these somewhat like a trichogram and just look at them without staining and without high power to find things like lice or chylotiella or you can actually stain your acetate tape like you would stain a glass slide and use it to find yeast and bacteria. So all of these things that you can see include insects, mites, skin cells, pollen is fun. Sometimes you get little pine pollen that looks like Mickey Mouse in there. Um, blood cells, fungi, and bacteria. So all of these things you can see on a tape prep or a swab smear or a glass slide impression. And those are all... Um, with the diff quick stain or sometimes a higher power even. And all those things you can do for your veterinarian before they even show up. Look, I made you the slide. They, let's, let's love this. This is something that they don't have to do now. So, all right, we're gonna go through a series of cases. Um, you're going to have to come up with the diagnosis. We're not gonna tell you until we hear it. So, good luck. <laughs> Unless we fail to animate appropriately. So we'll right. see how this goes. All right, so case number one. Species? Excellent. Everybody's awake. Okay. So we have a cat. Anybody want to describe a lesion for me? Hair loss. Good. Where is it? Generalized. Good. So we tend to use words like um, localized, diffuse, generalized. So this seems to be generalized. It's over a lot of the body. Is it worse in some areas than others? Yes. Yes. Where? The hind end, good, all right. So a little bit worse than the hind end, maybe generalized, but we do have a hind end pattern. Excellent. What do you want to do next? Okay, flea comb. Before that, I want one other thing. A physical exam, yay. Let's do a complete physical exam, because first thing we want to do is grab for the thing we think it is, right? But good, let's get a flea comb. I like that idea. So we're going to do a physical exam. We're going to flea comb the cat. What do you think we might find? We might find some of this, okay? This is a good one, right? We like this one. Obvious causes, yay. So this cat has a lot of hair loss missing. Mm -hmm. Do we think those fleas are entirely responsible? No. No. What, what else might be going on? Allergy. Allergy. Excellent. Hypersensitivity. You guys are on it. You are good. All right. So I put flea allergy dermatitis up with fad, um, but I put the allergy dermatitis in parentheses because it's important to remember this might be the 
what causes the itch, right? So the flea causes the itch, the cat tears it up, now it has a rash secondary to the itch. Which came first? The itch in this case, not the rash, okay? But if they have a severe allergic response, if they're hypersensitive, it's gonna be much worse and it's become much more generalized. And so we pause at that moment to say, is it just fleas or is it flea allergy dermatitis for this cat? And are they gonna have ongoing issues? Um, fleas affect many species and we're gonna go over kind of more of those species that can be affected by this. There's definitely somewhat of a pattern. So we look at the back end, the dorsum, the back, the tail base is a good place to look for them. Under the collar is a good place to look for them. What if I didn't find any fleas in this cat? Could it still be flea allergy dermatitis? It absolutely could still be flea allergy dermatitis. And it may be lots of other things. I heard mites back there. We're going to move on to that soon. Um, it could be other differentials. But not finding a flea doesn't necessarily rule out flea allergy dermatitis. If this cat came in with four other cats, where else might I want to look? Yeah. On the other cats, because this cat's grooming itself because it's having a hypersensitivity reaction. It may very well have groomed off the fleas that are causing the problem, but the history of other cats being affected affects how I then think of this cat before I go chasing down the, down the road of some other diagnosis. I'm still gonna do a minimum database to be sure I'm not gonna miss something, all of those things Dr. Dutard discussed, but that's how I'm thinking about this case. So this cat is itchy and there's fleas there. So easy button, boom. All right, how are we gonna treat it? Capstar, good. So first initial treatment, Capstar Y, what's that going to treat? The fleas acutely. 24 hours, it'll wipe those out. Then what else do, might we need to deal with? The hypersensitivity reaction. Like, what are we going to do next? So if we're looking at management, what's this species? Dog. Distribution. Hind end. Do I know for sure that's flea allergy dermatitis? Am I going to do my minimum database? Yes, I'm going to do everything else, but I have to suspect, especially if this dog came in with that cat, that there could be some flea problems in the household. Individual level, we're going to reach for antiparasitics. Your Capstar for immediate acute treatment, kill those fleas off within 24 hours, and then a residual project for more long, uh, product for more long term. I might need secondary antibiotics because we had an itch that rashed, and now we need to treat that secondary dermatitis or pyoderma. Um, and then we might need steroids for that hypersensitivity reaction. And this is where I pause. Why do I pause on steroids in a shelter? They're immunosuppressed animals under stress, and now we give them immunosuppressives. So I always pause there. I don't reach for steroids initially for these guys unless it's super, super severe and I've ruled everything else out because I don't want to miss something. But there is a chance, and especially in private practice, that steroids are going to be necessary for this cat to kind of quiet down that itch and that, um, that rash. On a shelter level, what are we going to do in terms of protocols for, for fleas in our shelter? Keep them separated. Keep them separated. Maybe treat everybody when they come in during flea season. In a lot of cases, we talk about retreating them monthly, just like we would in a home for our long-term stay shelters, our communal rooms that sort of thing, it's important to have a protocol. What is your preventive protocol for fleas in your shelter? What is your preventive protocol for fleas in your spay-neuter clinic, where different animals are coming in every day and exposing others? So it's important to think about when are you administering these flea products, are you doing it recurrent, and are you monitoring this poor flea allergic cat in your shelter who, as more animals come in, may be re-exposed and their product starts to wane, depending on how long they stay with you. What's our level of concern in terms of adoptability for this cat? Minimal. Minimal, okay. So most of us feel like we could get an adopter for a flea allergic cat. How many of you think this cat's adoptable in your shelter? Okay, so we're going to move forward with this cat. We're going to go ahead and put it up for adoption once we kind of handle it. Are we going to give any adoption counseling? Are we going to tell them? Yeah, because yeah, this is a manageable problem. This seems like a reasonable thing an owner could do. Fair? Yeah. All right, yay for this cat and this dog behind. <laughs> so I'll pause for just a moment because we're going to talk about hypersensitivity quite a bit today, but I wanted to say a few words about hypersensitivity diseases because for many of the things we're going to talk about, there's an underlying cause. We can point to a bug, we can point to a problem, but that hypersensitivity reaction is what's actually causing the disease and the signs in the animal. And you can get hypersensitivity diseases that are a response to any number of mites. So 
When you see animals with this kind of diffuse, generalized, over-grooming alopecia, you want to look for an underlying cause, and that could even be something like ear mites. It doesn't have to be in the region that's causing the problem. We have a tendency, I think, with cats who are over-grooming to want to blame their psychoses. We always want to give them a behavioral anxiety-related over-grooming disease. And I never want to do that until I have absolutely ruled out any other underlying cause that could be resulting in a hypersensitivity. This is a hypersensitivity disease in this cat. And so you want to look for those underlying causes and not miss it and not just call, call them you know, psychogenic alopecia. They're crazy. They have a behavioral problem. <laughs> Let's really try to address any medical that we can do. Hypersensitivity diseases take some time to develop. So generally, the problem has been there at least four weeks for them to develop this delayed allergic reaction. And so you can go back in time and start to look and say, OK, was there something else that may have occurred in that window? And again, that's history taking. We don't always have it. But if there's any opportunity to get history, follow it. And they're absolutely going to take time to recover. I have a couple cases in here. But my rule is, is that generally, however long it took to get the problem, it's going to take at least twice that long to solve the problem once they become chronic. And a hypersensitivity reaction's been going on in the building for at least weeks. And so I won't focus on the case quite yet, but recently we had a dog that's basically had skin problems for three years. And the adopter said to me, how long is it going to take to clear this up? And I was like, oh, honey, I wish I knew. <laughs> like, if I follow my rule, six years. And this is a four-year-old dog. Um, we're going to hope it's faster than that. But these are, a lot of these reactions, these hypersensitivity diseases, are chronic. They're going to take a long time. It's going to be management issues. And we'll talk about specific examples. But I wanted to get that up front. The other thing is that hypersensitivity diseases often require immunosuppression to get it under control. But if an infectious cause is what instituted that hypersensitivity reaction, you also need to deal with the infectious part of it, maybe first. And so I am not a fan of steroids in the shelter. I rarely reach for them in the shelter. But this is a case where you may have to do this in order to quiet down that skin once you deal with the initial condition. Great. Case two. Case number two. So this is a young cat with patchy areas of hair loss. <laughs> well, and knowing me, yes, probably that's what it is. But so um, what do you want to do? Woods lamp exam, that's great. What else do you want to do? Physical exam, thank you, thank you. So woods lamp should be part of your initial physical exam. Every animal that comes to the shelter, not a, not a bad idea to use that woods lamp on them. Only takes 30 seconds. Um, this cat has hair loss on her face, ears, and feet. Um, otherwise healthy, maybe, maybe there's a titch of upper respiratory, maybe a little bit of diarrhea, just like every other kitten. Um, may have concurrent ectoparasites. So if you have one of these diseases, doesn't mean you can't have another one of these diseases at the same time. And that second disease may make that first disease take longer to heal and complicate things. So make sure that you're looking for everything. Um, this is one of a litter from an overwhelmed shelter. It was transferred to a different shelter. So what does that make you think? Check the litter. Yeah, let's check the litter. Great. So this kitten is VAR eating, bouncing, and purring. So the kitten does not care. <laughs> the kitten would like to be on your shoulder snuggling your cheek. So here's your woods lamp exam. Yeah. Okay. And what do you want to do next? <laughs> Culture. Yeah, absolutely. So we know that this is probably ringworm. But every once in a while, the woods lamp picks up something that the cat got into and not actually the ringworm, right? So you want to make sure that this is what's going on. What other thing can you do with the hair that you pluck out of a toothbrush these days? Fancy diagnostic techniques. Yes. Yeah, PCR, exactly. So you can use the hair from the toothbrush on your culture, or you can use the hair on your toothbrush for a PCR. Both of those things are absolutely valid. So if you have a culture and you are in charge of reading the culture, because this is often a job for the veterinary technician, um, you want to read it every day. And by reading, what I mean is you look at it and you look to see if there's any little white fuzzy fungal growth, but also look for concurrent color change or even color change that's maybe a day ahead of that fungal growth that you're seeing. If you don't see color change and it's been several days, that means it's probably not a dermatophyte growing there. It's probably a saprophyte or some other type of fungus who pre preferentially eats carbohydrates, not protein. Dermatophytes eat protein. 
which is because protein skin is made out of protein, which is why they turn that color red on that plate. The PCR takes about five to seven days to come back. Sometimes it's a little bit faster than that. Um, if I'm diagnosing a cow with ringworm, I can, in my set setup with the incubator and everything that I have, I can usually get that plate to turn positive within those seven days. And so it's kind of up to you and your shelter, which, or both diagnostics that you guys want to do. Um, great. So we do multiple cultures. We do weekly cultures on our ringworm cats. This is also a job of the technician to go in there and to take the toothbrush and rub it on every single part of that cat and create those cultures that then the technician is also tasked with reading. Um, the dips are also things that the technicians do, although we feel so bad sometimes we help um, or have students help because that's what they're for. <laughs> um, yeah, so dipping and then daily medication is how we treat ringworm. Yes. Are you, how, how frequently are you doing? We do twice weekly dips. Mm -hmm. twice yeah, weekly? twice weekly, yes. Now you can take the toothbrush and brush it all over the body? All over the, the body. Teeth? No, you don't do their teeth. Oh, uh, well, I meant their, you know. The yeah, so we're not using it to brush their teeth, although that's fine. Um, <laughs> but, no, that's fine. <laughs> But so we, so if they have a lesion, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't ringworm somewhere else. If you have one lesion that you can see, there may be other areas of the body that are growing ringworm that you just don't know about. Do you use yeah, we do. Like a we use terbinafine and lime sulfur. And yeah. you don't use the topical. Because I'm trying to treat the whole cat. Yeah. I mean, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Do you pluck from the lesion and brush the rest of the body, or are you just using the two? I just use the toothbrush. I tend to brush everywhere but the lesion first, and then the lesion last to try to prevent me spreading the ringworm everywhere around the cat. They love it. They love the toothbrush. Yeah, it's the do. best <laughs> diagnostic test ever. Um, yeah, so other questions before we go on? OK, so from a population level, of course, ringworm is very scary because it not only spreads to us, like this poor, unfortunate little person right here, um, but here's the golden retriever with ringworm, he's a guinea pig with ringworm. Now, not all the different species tend to get the same species of dermatophyte. So the guinea pig actually has trichophyton um, because they like to get that one. And those don't glow, so you'd have to do a culture in order to diagnose that one. Um, but they are very happy to get it. Um, so what do we want to worry about in terms of population with ringworm? Why, why is it such a bad thing for us? Zoonotic. Yeah, zoonotic. Yeah, so it spreads to our staff, spreads to our volunteers, spreads to our doctors and our doctor's children and our doctor's immunosuppressed elderly people that live with them. And so this can be kind of a publicity nightmare, right? The animal itself, minus the bad, doesn't really care that it has ringworm and will go around and do its normal animal behavior um, without any trouble, except that what do we do when we find an animal that has ringworm? We isolate, isolate it. Isolate. For how long? Yeah, it's a long time, right? It's a long time. And so we, in a shelter, have to make sure that those animals stay sane for that long amount of isolation period. And so we need to provide them with enriched housing, with entertainment, with socialization, because they're kittens, right, most of the time, um, with um, something to do with themselves so that they don't go crazy when they're in isolation for four to six weeks, right? So that is something that... If you want to start to try to treat ringworm in your culture, or start, sorry, excuse me, start to try to treat ringworm in your shelter, make sure that you have good housing, long-term, sufficiently enriched housing for your cats that are in ringworm. It's very important. And they will get better faster. The more healthy they are, the less stressed they are. You'll have a much greater success in treating them if you can get rid of some of their stress, their kennel stress. So shelter outbreaks are bad. If you end up having one, give us a call. We will help you get through it. There are basically three outcomes for cats with ringworm. Do you know what they are? Number one is cure them. Right, sure, then, treat, then adopt them out. Great, no problems. What is the second one? Euthanasia, right. What's the third one? Adopt them out as is. Yeah, and there are some shelters that have to do that. So what do you do if you have to do that? What's really important? Education. education for the new adopter, for your staff, for everybody who's involved, for maybe even calling the veterinarian of that adopter before they adopt the animal and letting them know what's going on and how they can help manage this cat. Yep, so all of those three, th three things are viable outcomes 
for this kitten and guinea pig and golden retriever. Yes. Okay. All right. Case number three. Species? Dog. Dog. Four months old. What do you want to do? And it's, oh, I have a little bit of history. Um, it's been getting worse for like the last month. Just started losing hair. Skin scraping. Okay, so we want to do a skin scraping. Any suspects? Demodex. Oh my, look at that. So we do a nice little, we're doing a deep skin scraping. We're pinching that skin tightly. We're using that dull blade or a spatula. There's skin spatulas you can use. You're squeezing them out because where do they live? In the follicles. That long, long tail is going into the follicles. Good. So we do a skin scrape. We go down into those follicles. What about this dog? Ringworm. Could be ringworm. <laughs> Absolutely. Could be could be demodex. So what do we how do we describe this one? Localized. So that's going to be local demodex versus generalized demodex. Um, do we treat it differently? We might. So hold on. Um, so it's a follicular mite, like you told me. It's a normal commensal. All God's children got demodex. You've got demodex. Everybody's got demodex. So it is a normal commensal. So what's going on with this dog? Yeah, immunosuppressed, overgrowth. Now we've got a reaction to that. And so we've got a generalized problem. We're going to do a skin scrape, squeeze it till we've got capillary ooze. Also do that trichogram. I love Dr. Dattar's suggestion of one on each side. You pull the hairs and stick it on the other side. Because it is a follicular mite, and you will find them kind of at the base of the hairs when you pull those hairs out. So do the scrape, do the pluck, look under the microscope, find your demodex. How are we going to manage it? Is demodex canis, is demodex in dogs contagious? No. Not generally. Good. So our individual management, there's a variety of treatments you can use. And so you can use ivermectin. That tends to need to be daily in that dog, so you're going to have to think about how that happens. It generally takes, again, how long was it developing? A month, 30 to 90 days to clear these cases up. Doramectin is very similar to ivermectin, but actually only requires weekly dosing at a much higher dose. You can use Advantage Multi. That's one of my favorite things when you're not quite sure what you're working with. Advantage Multi gets almost everything, um, and that's every one to two weeks. You can use Brevecto, and this has become the most popular choice of our dermatologists at the vet school because you administer it and basically you're done. Um, and it treats that Demodex. It is expensive. But if you start to compare, you know, treating this dog every day, how long are you holding them, all that management, the Brevecto or the Next Guard becomes much more affordable. The Brevecto is three months though, right? Yep, exactly. I mean, you give it once and basically, and you know, when Dr. Miller presented this a couple years back, it was very early um, in that research. There have actually been a couple papers now, people kind of investigating this. Does it really clear up? It's not 100% for every dog but it seems to be working for a vast majority of them and a, and a good first line if indeed you have access to that product with your veterinarian um, and your shelter. Again, it is more expensive, but it's three months. And then follicular flushing shampoos, because it lives down in those follicles, we want some nice benzoyl peroxide or other, and by that I mean in the shampoo, don't go buy like OxyClean and wipe the dog with that. Um, but nice follicular flushing shampoos and bathe that dog. What about population management? Are we concerned about this dog in our population? No, generally not. This is not a contagious condition. This dog can move on. We're not going to worry too much. Just again, reminding you, everybody's got Demodex. I wanted to gross you out a little bit. Anybody from my generation, and there aren't many, you're all young out there, remember the That's Incredible episode where they showed people's Demodectic mites? in their eyelashes. You can still find it on YouTube. You have them in your eyelashes. You have them in their, your skin. They've discovered that some skin conditions like acne may be an overgrowth of demodex in people. So that's a little thing to take home with you today. Don't worry about that puppy with its demodex. You've got it too. It's fine. It's your, it's your own species. No, do not take Brevecto. <laughs> The other thing about Demodex is there's a couple different kinds in dogs, and we've only discovered this in the last decade or so. So I showed you this one. This is your Demodex canis with that little round tail. Notice this one with the long pointy tail. A little bit different. Anybody know what that is? Ingi. Excellent. So Demodex ingi. Does it act differently than Demodex canis? It does. We treat it the same. But this is exciting. How many of you know little white dogs that are all greasy and gross? and then they get itchy. Those little greasy white dogs may have Demodex, and they may have Demodex ingi. 
because it likes the sebaceous glands, those oil glands of the skin. And it's really pointy and likes to kind of live down in there. It is not typically associated with alopecia unless they now are itchy and they've got overgrowth and they're scratching and they're pulling out their hair. But it is associated with that greasy kind of nasty seborrhea coat. Um, it can be adult onset, so it's not necessarily your puppies. It's your adult dogs, and so you may not look for Demodex because you say to yourself, eh, it's not a puppy, it's not Demodex, and you don't do the skin scrape, and you miss it. Um, there is a breed disposition. It seems to really like West Highland Terriers, and I spoke with somebody yesterday who's probably in the room who was like, I had a Westie when I was young, and it was always greasy and always had skin problems, and I was like, I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So if you've got a little white dog that's really greasy, um, go looking for Demodex. Don't put that off your list because it's not a puppy. Wire-haired dogs, too. Um, it seems to be popular. Individual management is kind of the same thing as Demodex. So you can use your Ivermectins. You can use your Advantage Multi. You can use your Brevecto. All of those tra treatments seem to work. And for your shelter condition, not contagious. But this can make a huge difference in this dog's adoptability. Because if you've got that greasy little white dog that already has an attitude problem and you want to place it, it's going to be a lot nicer to place it if you feel like you can give them a prognosis that the grease isn't forever, right? So go looking for Demodex in these dogs. Don't miss it. Okay? Quick question. Should we shave them or will that make a difference in the follicle? There's no real need to shave them. It's in the follicle. Those shampoos are more important. And because it is in the follicle, those treatments that get deep into the skin are important. So I would not shave them in these cases. Um, the other thing is that if it's really localized, like that one little dog with the patch, and it is Demodex, you've scraped it, you've confirmed that, it's not ringworm. Um, a lot of times those guys don't need treatment at all. A lot of times those will resolve, and it was kind of caused by an initial, if it's one little patch, they will resolve on their own. So I don't go chasing those too much because all of these treatments are either long-term or expensive. All right, case number Great. four, good job. Case number four, so this is Gandalf. Gandalf is a TCSTCA alum. Um, what do you notice? What kind of species is this? <laughs> Canine. Canine, I think so. <laughs> kind of looks, looks like a dog. Um, might be a dragon. I'm not really sure. <laughs> There's no hair, so it's hard to see. Um, so where, where is the hair loss on this dog? Generalized. Generalized, yeah. So I will also tell you that he is extremely itchy, extremely pyritic. You touch his ear and his whole back end starts to shake, right? So what do you want to do? Skin scrape. And what kind of skin scraping do you want to do? So you can get away with superficial on this one. I would Both. recommend doing a, a deep skin scraping as well, just in case. Um, but the thing I want to do on this dog, too, is do multiple skin scrapings in multiple different places. Because the one that I'm looking for is elusive. He likes to hide. He doesn't like to find, be found. In fact, um, he's really, really hard to find on skin scraping, even though you can find him sometimes. Who's this? Scabies. Ooh. So yeah, so um, Sarcopte scabii. Why, why is everybody suddenly itching? <laughs> is it because this is zoonotic? Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so this is not species specific. In fact, it's um, multi, multiple species specific. If you, if you happen to be a mammal, it will be happy to live on you. Um, so in dogs, it's very, very itchy. This is one of those things that you can actually diagnose before you have any hair loss because of the itchiness that they feel. So this is the itch that then rashes. Um, secondary infections are very common because it's so pyritic. So they tear themselves apart. In fact, you'll get deep lacerations from their nails, from their teeth. They will just tear themselves apart, like I said, because um, everything is so, so itchy. Um, and it seems to uh, be very difficult for some uh, people to diagnose this. And so they end up with this condition for a long time. So you may end up with an animal that has basically no fur at all, anywhere, like gypsy here. Um, it is a surface mite, so a surface skin scraping should be all you need, although you don't know that when you go in looking for the mites and you want to do a deep, just in case this is Demodex. Um, and then the crusts are great places to look. So if you have a crust, they may be living in those crusts. They live in these little burrows that are in the sort of stratum corneum, which is the top layer of your skin. And so you might be able to find them if you can find one of those crusts. Um, and then a lot of times we just look at the dog like Gypsy. We didn't find Demodex on her. We just looked at her and said, you are itchy enough. You're bald enough. 
I'm going to treat you as though you're, you have scabies because you fit all of the different check marks, even though I can't actually find a mite on you. So one of the diagnostic tricks that the dermatologists talk about in vet school for scabies is the pinopedal reflex, the pinna of the ear. If you scratch that and their back leg starts going, the pedal, pinopedal reflex, it's just a sort of test of how puritic they are. Um, and then here's a lovely person with scabies. So <laughs> if you think that you might have a dog that has one of these conditions and you're about to do a physical exam, it does not take a long time to put gloves on. So please, please do that. Don't um, be like that person. Don't be like this person, yeah. So treating scabies, uh, what do you guys know about treating scabies? Revolution. Revolution, yeah, that works. A lot of the different avermectins work. Um, we use Advantage Multi, we use Revolution, we use a lot of different things. It's an every two week course um, for the topicals and we want to make sure that they aren't contagious by the time that we put them up for adoption. A lot of times they have secondary infections that we also need to treat and sometimes they have hypersensitivity reactions to the scabies mites and so they might need a little bit of help with some steroids but you want to make sure the mites are gone and the bacterial infection is gone before you start those types of things. <coughs> Mm -hmm. also they do. They do. Yes. And a lot of other mites, so Demodex as well. Yeah. Yeah. How much do you see this in cats? I don't see it in cats very often here, but there are other parts of the world where it's very common. Yeah. Yes. What do you inform for contagiousness, like for, for clearing? So what, what do I? Like when you adopt a mouse and they're like, how long is this technically contagious? Or right. So it should about? take these mites about two weeks to die. And then the new generation gets killed by your second application. So they really ought not to be contagious after those first two weeks. So at that point in time, they're probably not ready to go yet. They probably still haven't had their surgery. They probably still have secondary infections that we're dealing with. And so we don't usually make them available for adoption until they're long past any sort of contagiousness. Do you feel that yes. true with the revolution? I've mm -hmm. read that it says that like three to five days, they're less mm -hmm. contagious because mm -hmm. it's contagious. Do yeah, that's so true. That's true. Yeah, I do. What yes. About Oh, sorry. What about advantage multi? Is that similar? It, it, it has the same mechanism of action. So it, it should work the same way. Yes. Question back there. Mm -hmm. So these mites are, they're very specific to living on animals. They don't have any part of their life cycle that's off of the animal. So as long as the animal is not in that cage anymore, obviously you want to wash the bedding. But in about three days, you're not going to have any viable bugs on any of your bedding anymore. Same is true with um, if you have a, a guinea pig, for example, with scabies. What that looks like a lot of times is they are so itchy that it looks like they're having a seizure. Once you treat them, you get them going, you change their, the entire cage out in about a week or two, then you shouldn't have any mites in that, in that cage substrate anymore either. All right, great. Next. And so the other thing is there are so few mites that this is another example of a hypersensitivity reaction. Basically, that body's reacting. Right. There's very, very few mites on that animal, which is why you have trouble finding them. OK, so let's look at this kitty. And you might recognize this kitty from earlier. Um, any differentials for this cat? She looks like she could be having a hypersensitivity reaction to something. What do we want to do? Skin scrape. So we're going to try a skin scrape. And I'm going to tell you, we don't find anything on the skin scrape. But at the same time, we do a fecal on her because she just came into the shelter. And I find this in the fecal. What is that? Did I hear Demodex? But it's got a little short butt. It doesn't have that long, skinny butt. Is this really Demodex? The front end looks the same. This is Demodex. This is Demodex gatois. This is Demodex of the cat, which looks a little bit different. Because its butt is a little bit faster, or a little bit wider, it doesn't fit in that follicle as well. It's a more surface mite of cats. And it's really hard to find because they groom it off, which is why they now have no hair. All right? And so we often find it more in the fecals. You still want to do a scrape. You want to do a tape prep. And you can do it just as Dr. Detard, acetate tape. Um, Dr. Miller likes to use packing tape because it's a little thicker and heavier, but still clear. You can go ahead and do that, look under there, and you may find it. You may find it in the fecal that you do. And now you've got a diagnosis. 
In my hands, even if I don't find it, I sometimes say, I'm treating this cat for Demodex because it looks like Demodex. The other thing is that it acts more like Sarcoptes in cats. They are itchy. So although it's Demodex, it's living on the surface, they are itchy, they're having a hypersensitivity reaction, they're over-grooming their hair, and it's hard to find. So it acts more like Sarcoptes. Um, and guess what? Just like Sarcoptes, it's actually contagious. So more cats came in from the household and they're all itchy. Um, or it can spread through your shelter. So this is more of a management issue. Um, it is non-follicular, like I said, so it comes off in grooming. So the management of this is going to be a little bit more like sarcoptic mange, which is why I had it follow that, even though it's Demodex gatois in cats. So you can use lime sulfur. Lime sulfur is good for so many things. I know it smells terrible, but actually any itchy cat, if they will tolerate it behaviorally, can do really well with a lime sulfur dip or two. Um, you do it weekly. You can use ivermectin or doramectin. Again, it's that daily versus weekly. Advantage multi, weekly at every two weeks works, and that tends to be what I reach for first because it's the least invasive if I don't have a diagnosis. Um, it's important to know Revolution is reported not to work for this. So most of these are interchangeable when we talk about our ectins, but Revolution does not work for Demodex Gatois. So we, you want to reach for one of the other products. What about Brevecto for cats? Brevecto for cats should work, in theory. Um, it came out much later, and so last I knew, I don't think we have definitive information on that. Um, and I didn't get a chance to grab Dr. Miller, but last I talked to him, we, it should work. We just don't quite know yet for sure. Um, shelter management, we're going to treat this more like Sarcoptes. So we do have a little bit of a higher level of concern. It could be contagious to other cats. It is cat specific, but how many of you have communal room housing in your shelter? This could be a problem for you if you start putting cats together with these issues. Um, what's recommended is that you treat all in contact cats even if they don't have lesions. So if other cats came in from the household and you get a diagnosis of Demodex, you've got a couple cats in a group, you should just treat them all as if they have it because they're probably carrying some mites around. They may not be having as much of a reaction if their hypersensitivity is lower. Okay? okay. And we're going to pick up the pace and go a little bit faster. We did this on purpose, so we'll see how okay. this goes. Yeah. So this is the last of the particular cases. Um, I don't know who took this picture because it was one of our um, investigations pictures. Uh, what do you see going on here? It is an ear. It is an ear. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, eyeballs. Neck. There we go. Okay. Ear. Ear. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you said ear mites already, but what do we want to do first? Physical exam. Excellent. Um, ear swab. Yeah. So this is where you're sticking that swab in there and then putting it on the microscope and getting your diagnosis that way. Um, low power. You can actually see these with an otoscope as well. So if you stick your otoscope in that ear, you'll see little yellow bugs crawling around. It's pretty awesome. Um, they are external. They live on the surface of the skin. For me, the ear mites are not as bad as what the cat does to itself yeah. when it has them. Yeah. And also, they are extremely common. They are not, they, we don't see them very often in dogs. So if you see this kind of crusty ear in dogs, I'm going to look for them, but I'm mostly interested in whether they have an ear infection because that tends to be what it is. They can get it. Um, but here it is. Isn't that great? Look at those little hairs. Um, so management in the shelter, individual animals you want to treat, right? But it is contagious to other cats, especially to kittens. Um, so there's topical medications you can use inside the ear. There's topical medications you can use on the skin. You can also use injections of ivermectin or doramectin. Um, as a population, though, especially if you treat with flea medications, this tends to also get the ear mites as well. But it's so common that there may, depending on your population that you're seeing coming into your shelter, it may not be a bad idea to have treatment for ear mites be part of your intake protocol. And that way you don't have to worry about it when an animal comes in with ear mites. You can clean the ears, you can give them their protocol treatment, and then you can send them on their way. And that way you don't have problems. Yes? So um, we get a lot of transfers because we're mm -hmm. an actual rescue instead of a shelter. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll get a lot of transfers from the shelters. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at records from the shelters and they've used a different product that our we put revolution on everybody that comes mm -hmm. in, is it okay if they've already had something within the 30-day period to just start revolution as well as the intake, or should we wait for 30 days? 
Um, it depends on what they've had and how that's going to react. Yeah, I'm sorry. So she's one, she, her rescue organization uses revolution on intake for all incoming animals. Sometimes those animals have records of being treated with other flea products within 30 days of coming in. And so her question is whether it's okay to continue to use that revolution. It depends on what that product is. Um, for example, if they've had revolution and it's only been a week, I wouldn't do that because you're probably going to overdose them. Or selamectin, or sorry, excuse me, any of the other ivermectins. Um, you can use revolution every two weeks that, for certain diseases. So if it's been two weeks, I would think it would be okay. But I would make sure with your veterinarian that you're not going to give a toxic dose. Yep. Great. So we're going to fly through things as long as we have time. This is my other favorite mite, also in the same family as Sarcoptes and Ododectes. Those are all sort of related mites. Um, Nodoedris cati, this is what it looks like in a cat. And Nodoedris miris, this is what it looks like in a rat. So you may see pet rats that come in with these cauliflower-like lesions on their ears. That's a mite. It's also contagious to you. So uh, wear gloves, wash your hands, and treat the rat. Okay. Thank you. Have more. Oh, I think I have more. I have more. Yep. So next one. Do you guys know what this might be? Looks like dandruff. Walking around. Yes, rabbits. Um, rabbits. Make sure you're not using any frontline or fipronil products. They will have seizures. They might die use selamectin or other types of products. Cats can also get chylotiella. It looks like the other mites, except for it's got kind of this arrowhead-shaped body here. And last one. What are these? Lice. Lice. This is Philico subrostratus. In dogs, they have Linonathus setosus, um, and they are chewing lice in dogs and cats versus biting lice that we have in birds and things like that. They only infect one species. So these are not contagious to you, but they are contagious to the cat in the following cage. Um, tends to be kittens, tends to be immunosuppressed animals or very old animals that are having trouble that have these. Revolution kills them, absolutely. Advantage multi as well. It's really easy to find these on tape prep of the hair. Okay. And last one. So I don't know if you can see these. They are little tiny white creepy crawly things right here, right here, right here, right here. This is what it looks like sort of in a kitten before this is sort of Midwestern kitten. Any, any ideas what these might be? Warbles, yeah, warbles. Also known as a cuterebra. Here's one that's getting pulled out of the hole. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's excitement. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Yeah, so fly, we call this mydriasis. Any type of fly larva, a.k.a. maggot, um, can infect an animal when they are not grooming themselves. It's usually the, the um, or you have a wound that the fly then lays the egg in. In the Midwest, we get a lot of um, cuterebras, which is what these guys are, um, but we don't see them as commonly here. They can go up the nose, they can be in the brain, um, and then these are the debilitated animals that have open wounds. The flies have laid their eggs on them. The eggs have hatched. Now they are larvae. They tend to sort of excrete these proteases that sort of make everything kind of slimy and then eat away the dead tissue. They don't eat the living tissue. Um, Capstar is your friend in this situation. So same with the treat those fleas right away. It will kill the maggots as well. You want to clean everything off, make it nice, and, um, and then address whatever de or, uh, debilitation that that animal has as well. In that case, you would collect that. Um, the yeah, or probably, or depending on how much hair there is still left. Most of the time, there's not a lot of hair left in that spot. Most of the time, the hair's already fallen out. And here, in this picture here, it's just covering it from other places. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Does Capstar kill cuterebra? It does. Mm. It does. You have to mm. remove it. It's generally a good idea. All right. I'm getting the, we have to wrap no, no, up. No, no. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Does Capstar kill cuterebra? It does. It does. Um, but it's generally a good idea to get them out as opposed to killing them inside the animal because they can have a hypersensitivity reaction to the maggot that's still in their face. Maggot in your face. <laughs> I can't top my... So we have a couple rapid-fire slides, and then we do have to wrap up. So I'll give these to you as quick as I can. Anybody know this lesion? Warts, canine papillomatosis. Prognosis? Excellent. This resolves on its own. They will have all kinds of cauliflower stuff in their mouth. It will resolve. They will fall off. The only thing you need to do is, if it's a mechanical problem, remove it. 
Hypersensitivities, food allergy, and atopy. These are going to be your diagnoses that you get to when you've eliminated absolutely everything else. And these are the ones that are going to be lifelong management. So this is a whole day lecture. Um, but just to remind you that when you have eliminated all those other elements, you're going to be left with things that are chronic. Um, you're going to ask yourself seasonal versus non-seasonal. You're going to, this is your veterinarian's problem. Like, <laughs> this is no longer your problem, all right? It's going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of medications. It's going to take a lot of adoption counseling. Quick picture here. Anybody recognize this? Ear margin vasculitis. What causes it? It's a hypersensitivity reaction sometimes to vaccines. So my own little chihuahua got this to a rabies vaccine. So the ear margins, why, is the, why are they affected? Teeny tiny little capillaries. It's a hypersensitivity reaction. It's delayed. There's, immune, there's antibodies. They travel to those little capillaries, and you get a vasculitis of the ear margin that starts to flake off. So this can be vaccine-related. It is delayed, so you'll start to see this that three to four weeks post-vaccine, and then it extends. My dog took about six months to resolve. They'll sometimes even get a lovely lesion right where you gave them the vaccine, and then you know you got the diagnosis right. How about this cat? Mosquito bite hypersensitivity, meaning she got a mosquito bite, now she's having a crazy reaction to it. Self-resolving looks terrible, right? Differentials may be things that aren't, don't seem adoptable, but for that cat, just giving her some immunosuppressives or time will fix her. How about this cat? Indolent ulcers, excellent, I heard it. Why did we call it a rodent ulcer? We used to think the cat got bit by a rat. Um, but it doesn't, it is an underlying hypersensitivity. It is not contagious, it causes that ulcerative lesion of the lip. So we try to manage anything it might be allergic to. So you wanna use nice non-reactive bowls, you wanna make sure things are clean. Um, and often these can either self-resolve or respond well to steroid treatment. It is one of the options where you have to reach for steroids and you have to manage that in your shelter. And it may be recurrent, so there may be some adoption counseling. How about this? Eosinophilic plaque. I got a veterinarian in the front who's got all the answers for me today. So single, multiple raised lesions, this is a hypersensitivity reaction. There's an underlying cause you might have to chase. You're gonna chase all those mites and bugs and things first, and then it may be something like food or atopy, a much more complicated issue. But if you do a cytology, and we didn't talk a lot about cytology, we need a lab in that for you guys. But if you do a cytology, you're gonna find eosinophils in these cats, the allergic cells, not neutrophils and macrophages. And so you're gonna know that this is immuno, an immune problem. Burns, don't forget about burns. Cats can come in with injuries. And in this, I, I will make my last slide. What the heck is that? Anybody see the black rings around the nipples? This is the worst thing. Like, I was like, what is this? What is this monster cat problem with these black rings around the nipples? No problem, nasty nipple disease. She was nursing. <laughs> Easy peasy, you gotta take in care of, adopt her out, all right? It's the, I just thought it was a funny picture because everyone's like, what is going on with this cat? <laughs> You yeah. want to try to do a summary or you want to no, let No, that's go? fine. I'm just going to put this right. up for you guys to read because we covered everything already. Wear Thank gloves, you. wash your hands. Okay. <laughs>